Hey everyone, welcome to Mandela today. I hope you've had the most fantastic of weeks and most splendid of days leading up to this moment now when the show commences. And so, I'd like to introduce this program by stating, you know, modernity and I haven't always, we've had our disagreements, although I like to be on good terms of her when I can. And as a result, I trawl through the highest rated albums of 2024 on Rate Your Music to see if there is potential in the contemporary oceans of, of you know, recorded releases. It seems infinitesimal now. Just everyone's releasing everything on Bandcamp, YouTube, independent labels, Spotify, wherever, wherever you can go. Mm. And so I troll through here. And I say, what, what, what's, what's captivating me? What, what album artwork's interesting me? What genre names you is saying that you're me? trolling through the megahertz? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Patty Macaloon. Shout out. <laughs> Sprout. Thank you. And... So that brings us to this bandwagon here. Now, you see this in... This is the thumbnail. Bandwagon? This is the whole turning wheel of the Hindu cosmology. Now, the imaginal disc, Magdalene <laughs> Bay. Yeah, and that's even the title. These guys... I was familiar with their initial release, which came out in 2021. Yeah. I was quite fond of it. It was called yeah. Mercurial World. Yeah. I believe we listened to it around that time. No, I agree. That, that album's really good. Yeah. Yeah. And so... Um, how, how happy I was to note that when one day I checked, you know, read your music and seeing this, this nice image up every, I'm like, oh, okay, Magdalena Bay of a new release out. Not only that, it's, it's the best rated thing of the year thus far. Yeah, and it has been since pretty hard. much its release, which was the 23rd of August, 2024, where if the 2nd of October, 2024, now. Okay, yeah, so it's only about a month old as well. Yeah. Okay. And, and these things fluctuate quite rapidly. You know, people sure. you know, bandwagons brigade against them. Yeah, you know, oh, it's not that good, really. Sure, thing. sure. But this has remained at the top, and so you know, I listen to this. I'm saying, I wonder if I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon. Am I do? Am I gonna belong to this little sector of modernity? This this alleged mainstream. Whether this website reflects a mainstream is dubious at best, perhaps. But, it reflects a certain like uh, area of like hipsterdom or something. You know. Yeah, you know, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And here I am listening to it thinking, yes, I think modernity and I can get on quite well, at least for now. Uh, yeah, um, congrats everyone who, you know, voted this to the top. You guys were right. You guys are on the money. Uh, I'm very happy with what the site has collated here to name us the best. Now, but more happy, I'm more happy with Magdalena Bay because what they've done they're conscious of music history without falling into the trap of just repeating it for the sake of pretty. Like, what mm. what I hear here feels fresh, original, and uh, unpredictable, yeah. yet accessible. Yeah, they're conscious of the tropes, but trying to make accessible pop music. But add in what was probably the most interesting thing about the album, to my mind, is, like, modern production flares. Yes. You know, um, post-Indie Tronica almost, you know, they'll mix in, like, certain elements of, you know, wonky and glitch you know, uh, EDM production and stuff like that, which those were the nicest touches to my ears. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, you know, emerging into the, the 2020s, um, there's the question on everyone's mind and especially we we're all conscious of the post, you know, um, you know, where did the future go? All of that sort of, um, what is the sound of the present? All this, this sort of crisis we've had in culture. Hyper compressed drums and, um, hard clipped, <laughs> you know, echoes <laughs> yeah you know there was that whole question of you know what what's new you know is everything just a prestige of the past um and so when the 2020s emerges right away well people are kind of you know really looking for sounds which are not um you know immediately going to be dismissed as derivative of even just the previous decade the 2010s mm -hmm. and even a lot of really interesting albums that have come out thus far in the 20s have felt not unimaginable within the highest um, echelons of production technology in the 2010s, say. Mm. Um, but there is a lot of... What, what the 20s has been remarkable for is showing what DIY artists, seemingly DIY artists, just on Bandcamp have been capable of um, what, you know, artists like Animal Collective were striving hard to do in the earlier 2010s, say. Sure, you know, sure. You know, Death's Dynamic Shroud doing it seemingly every other week. Yeah, well, I was going to call this album Death's Dynamic Mazzy Star Collective. Oh, interesting. <laughs> no, this is like a more accessible Death's Dynamic time. Shroud, and I was... Yeah, really yeah, yeah. It, it, it takes, like, like some of the sound palette sort of stuff. And like I said, um, contemporary 
like EDM production choices and, and then I guess morphs it more into uh, like pop music. The one thing I, the other thing I, I, I liked about this album actually was that the songs weren't like pop songs constructed as such no. in the way you'd think about them. They're not hyper they, they were more like three Pitches. or four minute like little prog suite things, you know? There was like a sort of a, a very like, there, there was no hard pop structure to it. There's a sort of like floating structure and so, yeah, it'll move from one little sweet moment into the next. And maybe there's like three or four songs with a chorus, but a few of the songs don't even really have a, a, a chorus, let's say, you know? They sort of just go from one moment to the next, like one melodic moment or movement to the next, you know? So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I feel like, I don't know if you'll agree with me, I mean, maybe there are other instances that we can point to in this decade thus far, but... We've really found a great, rich, unique sound, which I feel like couldn't have been entirely procured in the 2010s. Mm. And this does feel like, whether it's the um, culmination of all, you know, hi-fi technology just being, you know, uh, just labored over every year, or whether it's um, something about the, um, yeah, as you said, there's no um, formal structures being adhered to, at least in a, more recent um, pop memory. Not a pop structure, yeah, yeah. It, it, it feels a bit more sort of, um, yeah, like a movement or, you know, it's, it's not constantly coming back around to choruses and verses and bridges and refrains and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, it, it, there's a few songs that do, like I said, but apparently it was even meant to be like a sort of concept album as well. I see. Which um, sort of, it, it makes sense given the structure of the album. Um, I think I, I might have slightly preferred... I haven't listened to it like you mentioned in a while, but the first album had a more sort of distinct sound, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like it sort of sounded like... It couldn't have sounded like any other group. Whereas this one yeah. felt a bit more like... It, it was less distinctly Magdalena Bay as like a unique sort of soundscape. Yeah, I hear what you mean. It, it was a bit more sort of um, general, I suppose. Um not to take away from the creativity of it though, but I, I, I yeah, I have to listen to that first album again because I remember that just having a very distinct like oral quality to it where you couldn't yeah. confuse it for other things, you know? Yeah. Uh, which maybe this one's missing a bit of because um, one thing, probably the only negative thing, which isn't even that negative, it doesn't apply too much, it just sort of was a humorous thing I thought of while listening to it early in the morning. It was like, you know, the, the, the late great Martin Luther King said of Usher, um... <laughs> I just want to say to Magdalena Bay, Kate Bush is not a genre. Okay. <laughs> so that that's the maybe the one sort of criticism I'd have of the album. It, it's um a bit in debt to that sort of world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which is not a bad thing. Just like I said, it's less like seemingly less individual to them than the previous album was. Yeah, though this album might have better songs. I'd have to once again go back and listen to that first one. Because there were a few songs on here that really did, uh, at least three or four, that like sort of transcended that, you know, just just in their sort of strange structure or lack of, you know. Yeah, you know, albums like this have me thinking about where, you know, we mentioned them before. You know, where Animal Collective were circa the late two thousands. You're like, and you're thinking like, what what can we do beyond this? And then, but Animal Collective maybe sometimes, but they never quite lived up to that promise over his money issue over his uh, matter of technology over his creativity I don't know mm. but sometimes you know I'd listen to you know uh, Faith and Persona and uh, Blue Ocean by Death's Dynamic Shroud mm. in this decade I'm thinking this is kind of where I wanted this Animal Collective say to be five years ago or ten years ago sure ago, um, now um, sure sure and even like uh, like I almost wish contemporary OMD had some of these touches yes like Andy McCluskey said he was looking for newer younger producers I hope he gets in contact with these guys yeah this has been made of quite a bit of a splash so I hope so yeah because yeah. I feel that that combo would work really seems well seems like the kind of thing those guys would like yeah you'd think so I'm sure they've heard Dazzle Ships there's moments of Dazzle Ships all over the production on this album you know the sort of especially the first track is very Animal Collective slash Dazzle Ships very like maximalist and mm. you know sort of uh, bombastic electro. You know? <laughs> and Wallace, what I admire about Death's Dynamic Shroud is its ability to kind of infuse these avant-garde, more experimental indie uh, sort of stylings into disembodied vocal samples and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, into music that can be accepted by you know a more sort of mainstream dance electro crowd in terms of like people our age or younger who are into semi 
uh, what would you call abrasive forms of music as it is you know what I mean like yeah. some of the cliches in contemporary pop music are what we'd certainly by our parents standards call quite abrasive you know what I mean um, and Def and Mac Shroud engage in those tropes to a degree with, to which maybe our parents generation would find them alienating but I feel like possibly I could be wrong um, Magdalena Bay of Bridge the Gap with uh, imagine with image imaginal disc here yeah um, yeah and, and it has crafted something which could be played and appreciated as both easy listening and kind of dense popish music by people say of our parents generation yeah yeah between the like sort of bombastic electro and like there was a song called like true blue or something <laughs> early on and i was like man this should have been the red dog 2 theme song yeah and then yeah the album sort of after the it opens a bit more like out there than it, it ends up sort of similar to that point, architecture yeah. and house sinky album you suggested yeah, yeah like yeah. after the first yeah, initial yeah. sort of strange pop songs it gets caught in that like indie tronica like you know i'm pretty sure it's like eight over four like gallop beat you know like a disco gallop beat you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. rather than four four it's just got that extra hi-hat between each beat and um a few of the tracks do fall into that sort of thing which is a very accessible sort of style of pop electro you know yeah. so it does bridge that and, and between that it does sort of have its moments of like dissonance and stuff as well so maybe it is doomed to be like bandwagoned in the sort of hipster crowd or whatever but even then that'll, that'll give it more sort of notoriety than I, I think it, it can only be like a net plus in the long run you know what I mean because well, even if everyone's sort of jumping on it is this going to have a cumulative value well that's what I yeah that's sort of what I was trying to articulate but like even if people jumped on the bandwagon of Velvet Underground they still listen they still got Velvet Underground out there exactly exactly that's and, a lot which like I said me might help with like posterity or notoriety in a way that the sort of fleeting 15 seconds of mainstream fame doesn't you know yeah yeah so that that could be a plus to it yeah yeah, interesting to see such a, a dominant neo psych sound in something so. Um, I mean, we saw this with Animal Collective, I guess, in the late two thousands. But I feel like a neo psych was a little bit out of favor there in the twenty tens, in lieu of more like um, sort of political hip hop. Oh, um, except for Tame Impala. R&B styles. Yeah, but even then, that was such a popified sort of milk toast version. Yeah, well, I mean, that was the version. No disrespect to you guys. Like, like um, yeah. Old J as well. You know, they were. That's that. even more so. That was like a yeah. popified neo psych like Maybe I have a bias though. against Australians trying to do it, just because you might. Oh, well, is, Old J, know, J you know, like Canadian or something. Oh, true, true. They're yeah. very popular here, though. They were huge here. Yeah, yeah they were huge here. Man, who are the ones here? Vance Joy. They were. Oh, well, yeah, um, that's like landfill indie, like, <laughs> ukulele music, though, you know. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah that was a yeah. dark time. Here. But, um, <laughs> but no, um, but that was a dark time, but I'm feeling quite good about the state of contemporary music releases. Yeah, there's still Magdalena Bay. interesting, like, alt- alt-pop albums, you know. Hell yeah. Like, sometimes every now and then, the, a mainstream pop album will sort of gain traction as being actually good or something. But I'm far more skeptical of, of stuff like that rather than alt pop. You know, generally alt pop is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, um, as someone who thought um, how I'm feeling now is quite good, uh, can't express anything remotely like that level of praise. Brat, Brat's as crummy as the follow up from like a couple of years ago for Charlie XCX. Oh, and sure. Like, Listen to this. Yeah, that's, that's right. Layered number two. That's rubbish. That's a good Listen album to, to sort of juxtapose to this one because they're they're sort of probably one and two on the RYM year chart. Yeah, and similar right sort now, of at least. situations going on with like sort of gun and fandoms. But mm. Charlie XCX falls a bit more into the mainstream. You know, she came from doing Iggy Azalea songs and yeah, shit like garbage. that. You know? Speaking of Australian garbage, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it all connects. Damn it, I'm ashamed. No, but, um, wow, like, very blessed times we are in here today. Because it's easy to talk back at the 20th century as a sort of goldmine of, of great recorded music, although sometimes, um, you know, the, the, the oceans of the, the magnitude of, of, of mm. material currently is, is I, astounding. I do Not like the, the, to- co- the contemporary, but, like, I, I was watching a bit of some, like, Mark Fisher lecture yesterday where he's, like, nervously pacing around and stuff. Yeah. And he's just talking about how indebted culture is to the 20th century. And I was thinking about that in like relation to stuff like my first pick, say, OK to Miz and John Diani, yeah. Johnny Diani doing um, The Witch Doctor's Son. Uh-huh. Um, I-, I was just like, 
I, I definitely agree with his sentiment and his point of like what year was the lecture? Like 2011 remember. maybe? 2011 or 12 or something. In 11, that was very true of, of our culture. Like, yeah. Compared to what, how 91 was like not indebted to 81, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking less sonically though and, and more in terms of like uh, some sort of uh, external present that is conceptualized there where I think the world he's talking about of like contemporaneous pop culture is just like, it's a very valid thing. But for me personally... Like, I'm just not, like, a sort of a sicko fan. I fall more into the line of, like, recluse. So I really do feel that, like, this age that he's describing as a dystopia is actually something, in a way, I would prefer. You know, not all the sort of overarching dystopian elements. Yeah. But the sort of um, lack of, like, an immediate cultural, like, you know, art, like, sycophancy, you know. I, I really could care less that that's gone, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Which is why... Like, something like RYM as a sort of digital sycophancy is a bit annoying. Yes. Whereas sure. as an archive, is as a tool, I, I really love it. Yeah, which is how than Discogs. Yeah, it's much more... Uh, a better UI to use. I mean, that is a Discogs. joke, but it is true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Discogs probably has more stuff on there, but it's yeah. just very inconvenient to sort of surf, to surf through, you know? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it's like the difference between IMDb and Letterboxd now, essentially. Whereas, like, if you just go through different genre listings on RYM, there are, like, gold mines. Like, one is avant-garde jazz, which is where I would have come across this album. Like, a very sort of, like, you know, like, a modest album for its day. But um, because of that, just isn't sort of, doesn't have the traction of, say, something like Western music media, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why I do, like, uh, the sort of paradigm we exist in now, because... Funny to bring it back to Mark Fisher. Like the second I start this album, we always off, do. Yeah, I guess the um the opening, the side A of this album's, um, OK Tim is, and it's a sort of like North African take on jazz music. And side B's Johnny Diani. Like they're working together, but yeah. I guess they're different styles, and that's meant to be like like South African, like Cape jazz sort of stuff. Yeah, but um, one of them's from Turkey and one of them's from South Africa. OK Turkey, yeah, yeah. And that, that sort of, like, North African Turkish stuff at the start, there's something about those, like... It, it's a very sort of, like, tribal, almost proto-EDM rhythm. Like, when I was listening to it, I was like, this sounds like genres like jungle. <laughs> or, like, they're doing a sort of analogue format of what eventually would become to, come to be distilled as electronic jungle music, you know? Yes. And so there's just this crazy, like, offbeat jazz music that is... It's just so, like... Um sort of primal, you know, that, that, um, I, I honestly can't believe it's, yeah, there's something about Afro jazz, which is, especially the North African stuff, I, I find personally very mesmerizing. Like, side B of this is pretty good. It, it has its moments, especially the sort of chanty stuff, but I, I'm not overly familiar with Cape jazz, but I feel it's a bit too, like, boppy sometimes. That sort of cheesy bop, if you know what I mean. Abdullah Ibrahim some good stuff. I don't okay. know if he's, he's, He's the most. He's the biggest name in Cape jazz that I'm aware of, and he'd be the one I'm for most familiar with. Okay. He's more dense piano jazz. To okay, me. cool. He, yeah, he like I said, I'm not too familiar, so I should check him out. I'm sure he's like a big Van Gogh. My memories of him were quite positive. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But um, just as a sort of like obscure, interesting, like yeah, tribal jazz album, I was just like, this is sort of entrancing, you know. Like I said, I prefer side A, but um, all the way through, it's just like. Especially by like the second track, it's it's going into that sort of on the corner territory, and then you hear the sleigh bells, and you're like, "Man, jazz with sleigh bells is how you know that you're in deep." You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tem is he's from Turkey, and um, okay. Jay Diani, yeah, he's from South Africa. South Africa okay. um, and what was interesting to note is that I'm, I'm looking at this from Discogs, is that um, there are a lot of uh, contributions from players from uh, Europe. The, the producer is mm. Ergen Benner, who's from excuse the internet um yeah I believe these are these are this must have been recorded in like Germany or something Europe Greece maybe okay um, maybe it is Turkish excuse me maybe these are Turkish names and I'm you know they're not Turkish names aren't dissimilar to names from Greece sure sure Germany sure sometimes yeah yeah Safed Kudega um and this sort of acrylic text here makes me suspect that maybe it's Turkish I assume it was probably produced in some way that wasn't like you know a western studio or whatever yeah because yeah. it's not a hi-fi record but nah doesn't really i feel lose anything despite not the at sort all. of lo-fi quality you know no it's got the really good out there qualities of, of stranger um, forms of you know 
um, American jazz of the of the seventies. You know, yeah. it, it fits well into into that sort of paradigm. And I think anyone who's sort of keen on that sort of out there, strange, unpredictable jazz of that time will find a lot to enjoy on here. It's it's the kind of thing you'd find on your Saturn archives or your Should Be Asleep, etc. Sure, sure. Um, jazz time of Jarvis X, what have you. Even like a breakbeat or like EDM Should Be Asleep's fan. more ambient. <laughs> Excuse I, me, yeah. I think might even like this as well. You know, mm. it, it has a different sonic mm. palette, but like percussively is very similar. Yeah, no, it was it was a rich time for it. it it's a shame to think about how I think jazz critics slash music critics of the 70s thought jazz in its more out there sort of you know pan-african forms in the 70s was a bit too bit too crazy and obviously there was a lot of disdain toward toward fusion mm. but even d- discounting the fusion like the non-electric styles even in the more in this even the acoustic you know stuff like kawaida that amazing album which um albert heath herbie hancock the two main a bunch of other people worked on like it's really extraordinary and obviously Hancock's own Moandishi mm. um, Matume's other work like uh, that, that stuff was very rare and no one would have heard it if not for the internet to be, to be fair if like, not for Biggie Smalls well that <laughs> but he's got a very rare like 76 sort of LP yeah yeah I, I tried uploading it once but they copyrighted me straight up yeah yeah I think they want to keep it off oh interesting okay. they want to like keep it rare <laughs> fair enough I guess it's, <laughs> it's good for the estate no yeah. but um yeah, like it's it's one of those things where I think you know critics may have thought it was indulgent or not tasteful at the time, or probably not even heard it. You know, well, that's a good point I, I doubt this was in heavy rotation in the US. But or I mean, just stuff of the more out there jazz in general, and the US Zenies. sort of stuff in a similar vein. Yeah, yeah, because you know it, it's just it's interesting how the, the critics come later to class to, to you know ascribe ascribe a certain sophistication to these radical breaks from the past. And then when more radical breaks from the past occur, it's just like, oh, this is, you guys are dogs. You guys are just like witless, sort of just like, it's like when you hear Chris Gow shitting on like Sonic Youth in, in the 80s, you're just like, who are you again? Like, yeah. What's your, pro- what's your problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, it's whatever. Sure. He, he plays <laughs> it at times as well, to be fair, but, but it's just one of those things where um, he just came across as like generational gatekeeping. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. We were the ones. We'll, we'll, we're we're going to show you how to do it. It peaks with like, the New York Dolls mm. and kind of blue. Anyway, that, that's a certain perspective. But, um, but, well, speaking of sort of New York bands with a bit of cred, I don't know if we can call it cred. Let's call it that, maybe. Uh, oh, I was never yeah. that into this group. Are these guys from New York? They are. Okay. Historically, I've actually not actually been the biggest fan of this group. Well, speaking of African music, too, that was their big claim to fame. Was it? Yeah, it was like lifting like African pop music or whatever. Oh, like was it a scandal or like? No, no, it was considered like a quality. Oh, you know, because it's it's something not many bands would do. It's it's straight out of the like late two thousand sort of hipster era, all right. I never noticed any of that in their music. I just thought it was indie bland or whatever. Yeah, well, I noticed that when um, I uploaded some random like, uh, it was probably like a Garden album or something. And, like, one of my mates who's a mad fan of Vampire Weekend was like, man, this sounds so much like it. And then my brother was also, like, he was following my channel. was like, <laughs> this isn't as good as Vampire Weekend. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, like, their big thing at the time. Okay, yeah. Because the, the thing is, like, um, you know, I, I see this listed and with a lot of praise toward it, and I decided... The reason I actually decided to check this out, I wouldn't have otherwise, is because there was a period in... If, the start of the decade where I was trying to give chances to a lot of the a lot of the band the sort of indie groups which I wasn't as fond of from the 2000s got a bit more electronic and used, employed synthesizers more so in the 2010s and sure. sometimes I enjoyed their music a bit more Arcade Fire is the premier example yeah that uh, Reflector album yeah yeah um, the two afterward weren't as interesting but Reflector was great I guess you, you selected Brian Jonestown like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that was a great example but, of but, it but they were big in the 2000s too. I really liked where Interpol developed on the third album onward sure and, sure. and so it, it was this interesting I, I was really trying to give a lot of these groups second chances effectively and one of the groups I did actually was was I listened to the more recent Vampire Weekend album around that time which this would have been 2021 but the most recent name was 2019's Father of the Bride yeah and I remember thinking yeah, this is actually pretty good maybe yeah. I'll give the older stuff a go and like I, I still didn't like Vampire Weekend or Contra I didn't go back to the 2013 album because I, I just Listen, the claimed music from around that time was like Tame Impala and Arctic Monkeys. I, I don't give a fuck. I, 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 I yeah. have no faith in what the fuck that sounds like. Again. Uh, sorry. 
But 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 no. Um. But that that being said, like I do remember thinking initially that Father of the Bride thing was pretty good. Uh, it sure. might it might still be. I haven't heard it since then. But I've heard only God for, was above us like three times now, and I I think I'm starting to believe the hype about this band is maybe this band's starting to believe they're in hype, and I'm starting to believe they're in hype too. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. This the songwriter's maturing quite a lot. That must be it. But also, like, think about it. Like, you know, if everyone's calling you, like, brilliant and all that, and you've got these three records out, and, you know, you put it all together, like, part of you's thinking, like, is it that good? Am I that good? You could take, you could go the route of, oh, yeah, they're right, I am a genius. Or you could go the, am I that good? And then you start questioning, questioning, questioning. And then you start writing actually good songs, which I suspect is where Only God Was Above Us Sure, um, sure. It is a byproduct of. Maybe there's some produ- producer involved. Um, maybe I'm not as. Yeah, well, my mate, who's the Vampire Weekend fan, Please. said that, that that's um, was initially going to be like a solo album. Oh. Um, but they, I guess, just decided to release it as Vampire Weekend, and that the songs were like very like serious in a sort of you know metaphysical singer songwriter sort of way, which in, was the initial impression I got of like the first few albums on uh, the first few songs on this album. I was like, okay, yeah, this guy's really taking these songs like very seriously, you know. Yeah. It was sort of right there from the start. And um, though my mate did mention that was more the case in The Father of a Bride, whereas this one was that, but then a bit more musical, which was definitely true. Like, I, I haven't heard the previous album, but um, it, this did sort of feel like a blending of a... like a hyper-serious, like, you know, singer-songwriter sort of album. Like, it's even listed as something like Chamber Pop. And it sort of reminded me a little bit. It's a bit more jangle rather than, um, I don't know what you call this one, mixed in with like chamber, just like indie rock, you know, with various styles or whatever. But it reminded me of the, the Apartments. Um, mm, they did an that. album in like the mid-2010s. Okay, that one. Called, yeah. yeah, No Song, No Spell, No Magical. And it's all these like hyper-serious, like, you know, metaphysical singer-songwriter sort of stuff with a band around it and like, you know, various almost like classical musical moments. And this album felt very much like that, you know, very like um, laboured over like the, the songs and the production, the songwriting elements, the arrangements. Like it, if I've only heard it the once, except for the, the first single I heard a, a couple of times prior to hearing this today. But it feels very like laboured over, definitely in a good way. Like mm. it, it, it's almost like a sort of perfectionism sort of uh, was executed, you know. Yeah, it's one of these things where, and look, like, if you can bring me around to a group that I used to be, this is the group, like, circa 2018, I used to, like, say the nastiest things about this band and the people <laughs> who listen to them. But um, now I'm at a point where, like, look, guys, you, you've won me over, and, um, you know, kudos. And that's part of the reason why, like, this probably wouldn't, if I had, like, to collate, uh, realistically, this probably wouldn't end up on, like, if I did a top 50 of this year, because there's so much good stuff coming out, mind you, this probably wouldn't even end up on a top 50 I did of the year, maybe. Sure. But I'm so impressed that these, you know, I mean, some of the songs yeah. on there are fantastic. Yeah, and no. The production's I'm, great. I'm like, it's a really great release there. all in all, but part of the reason I did want to bring it up here, just so I could say, yeah, look, I'll, I'll admit where, I, you know, I accused you guys of being talentless hacks, not publicly, but, you know, uh, you're not, you're, you're the furthest thing from that, guys, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> That's what I have to say. Yeah, nice. Yeah, there was a song on here. I can't remember what it was called. It was like Gen X Cops or something. Sure, yeah, yeah. Which I like tried to look up because I, I heard uh, like just a lyric popped out of my head about like it being your academy. And I'm like, is that a, a, a Mission to Burma reference? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to look up the song. And then when I looked up the title of the song, it was, it was like a, some like trashy B movie from like the late 80s. Okay. And I was like, oh, wow. That's I guess where they got the song title from. But then the lyrics, I because I, I, I had to film. you know read over them to because of that reference. So it wasn't a reference to Mission of Burma, but um, I was like, man, these are actually like because they're fairly inaudible unless you're you know following along or something. Okay, yeah. So I'm reading them off and I'm like, these are like pretty good lyrics. It's um mm. especially for like a pop song, you know. It's not like some sort of um like, like it's not Shakespeare, but it's it's written to be used in a song. And so when you you read it, you're just like, man putting these lyrics into a pop song is kind of very interesting yeah and sometimes like and it was about like a generational sort of gap thing that's very like culture conscious I'm like clearly he's thinking about these songs quite a lot you know that's what I was just gonna say um, sometimes like we (laughs) 
we kind of freeze these bands in our minds at the moment, like when they became popular. So in our mind, like Vampire Weekend are still like, you know, they would have been younger than us when they got big, say. Um, and there's like, oh, there's there. But it's like, wait a minute. Younger than us then, they'd be like, what, 10, 15 years older than us? Oh, so these people have like gone through a lot and they've got a lot to say, potentially. It's like, um, it is a real yeah. um, testament to this idea that, um, you know, take these two seriously as like people, human beings who've, who've grown and, um, and and insist that they have something to say. Uh, I, I, I'll listen and to the, whatever they've got next. Apparently the album cover is such as well because they like New York's in the 70s aesthetics, but to be fair, who doesn't? It's such a great world to draw from. Like, Marathon man, fun. It's been drawn from a million times, but there's still so much more to be, you know. <laughs> it's just such a weird time and a place. Yeah. No wonder Patti Smith was so popular. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> never compelled with the Patti Smith stuff, to be honest. But mm. I guess it, you must have yet to be there, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, obviously I was born way too late for that. Um, my goodness. Anyway, speaking of interesting aesthetics and times and places, one place Whoa. we seem to come back to relatively often, thanks to you on this program, Man. is New Zealand in the <clears throat> 1980s. I'm always going to 80s New Zealand, but this is like the, the thing that started it all in a way. M- maybe it was split ends, but in as far as like the... Involvement of Chris Knox... Yeah, and well, and similar to something like Split Ends, apparently the infamous thing with Toy Love is they tried to go over to Australia. You know how I've probably mentioned before these Kiwi bands, that was the MO. But within six months, like Chris Knox was just like, oh, screw this. <laughs> they go back to New Zealand, play for a few more months, and then he breaks them up and invents Slacker Rock with the Tall Dwarf. <laughs> okay, yeah. But like, as far as Toy Love, Toy Love goes, this is like their, yeah, one and only album. Mostly, like, songs also from their first wave punk band. It's, like, slightly hardcore punk. Or, like, um... Oh, what was the Australian? Uh, Murder Punk. The, mm-hmm. the Australian punk compilation. It's, like, there's the... The first wave punk from Australia and New Zealand is just, like, grittier than, like, English first wave punk. Like, the the Clash's first album, Sex Pistols, is pretty gritty. Uh, gritty but it, not to the same degree where, like, the Australian and New Zealand stuff is almost, like, proto-hardcore punk. Well, the UK definitely had a lot of respect for Birthday Party, so yeah. That's probably yeah. For that. They thought they were pretty out there, yeah. Yeah, Birthday Party, definitely. They were probably the biggest of those, like, old, you know, Australia and New Zealand bands in England, easily. And that's sort of why they still got that legacy as well. But, um, yeah, as far as this album goes, so yeah, I found out the other day, they did, while they're in Australia, they even played, like, Countdown. So they're like on the verge of being like split ends level, but you can hear why they just weren't because they, they, they just can't remove themselves from like, you know, a band like apparently they also toured with In Excess, for example, wow. in like 1980. <laughs> so in the punk scene, you've got these people that are, I suppose are the pure punks or the, the music loving punks. And then there's the fashion punks or the industry punks and stuff. And I guess they just, you know didn't want to deviate into that sort of more polished, like, new wave, new romantic punk sound. Um, which you can hear why on this. It's, it's like an updated version of, like, the Stooges or something, mixed with that sort of New York sort of 70s songs. So, yeah. And um, just, like, hyper-magnetic and, like, sort of energetic two-and-a-half-minute sort of long songs, but then mixed in with, like, early sort of, like, extended magazine-esque, like, post-punk jam sort of stuff. Like, this album sort of, yeah, it reminds me of a mix between, like, Pink Flag and, and the first magazine album as well, in, in that sort of sense. As well with things like The Stooges. It's just such a weird amalgamation of sounds that, yeah, it sounds more like something out of, like, yeah, one of those, like, post-punk revival bands and even one of these bands, you know? Like, one of those Australian late 2000s ones. But I think stuff like this is the world they drew from. And, yeah, but... Beyond all that, it's sort of time and place and uniqueness as a sort of punk recording. It's Yeah, it's also just full of these like weird offbeat songs, you know, like there's one called like Bride of Frankenstein. It's like very sort of Rokey Erickson as well. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, man, I, I've always loved Pull Down the Shades and um, yeah, there's a weird track on here called like Swimming Pool as well. I'm just like, man, it's just full of these like great little like new wave songs, you know. It's like if Alternative TV was a new wave band. <laughs> so like I'm comparing this to a lot of things, but that's just what it's. It's such a, an amalgamation of sounds. I can't believe it came out of such a particular place. 
Like, it's not the greatest album ever, but it's just, like, a fun, sort of concise, like, in a way, like, pop rock post-punk record, you know? Well, yeah, you know, the interesting thing about the, this album is, is, like, there's no... I don't think there's anything that could really pass as a hit single on here. No, it, it's a bit Richard Hell like that as well. Yeah, there, <laughs> there, there are songs which um, people wouldn't complain if they heard them on the radio, but would, like... Like, they wouldn't call in and say, like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe some of them, but um, <laughs> generally speaking, it's, it's one of those things where it's not... Like Magazine, I suppose, it, it was it was not... Um, you kind of had to sometimes listen to it to, to really know where they were um, kind of experimenting. And that was the beauty of it. Like, you know how people used to say, like, oh, the police are actually really smart if you listen to it. No, Magazine are actually really smart when you listen yeah, to it. Yeah, um, yeah. And when it was like, you know, the police sort of catered too much to the pop sensibilities, whereas I think Magazine sort of... Um, Dumb did the sort of rock and pop stylings a bit less. I feel. Yeah, definitely. I think. I think the police was just pillaging the sort of and Caribbean, then Caribbean sound. And then they yeah. had actual philosophical lyrics as nonsense. well. Yeah. yeah, the police have like pseudo philosophical lyrics. Yeah, references to like bandwagon literature, things like that. Which, when magazine do or have like a little lyric like "I know the meaning of life, but it doesn't help me a bit." <laughs> it's one of my favorite lyrics. Out of <laughs> what a great lyric! Yeah, those guys were great. Yeah. And um, now the thing is, like, the reason I kind of started the spiel is because I wanted to... Toy Love is the kind of... If you play this record for, like, you know, just a, a function of, you know, people... I don't know, like, like our, our parents' generation, like, that sort of, you know... That sort of popular side of punk and new wave. Yeah, movies. they're like Radio Birdman. Yeah, so. you know what I mean? Like, you could, you could play this sort of record at these sort of functions and, like, no one would bat an eye. They would just enjoy it. You know what I mean? Sure. And that's the beauty of it because, well, one of the beauties of it is, 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 is you can sort of, um, on, on, you know, it doesn't dumb the audience down, but at the same time, like, it sort of, um, like, sort of socially adheres to, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't try to alienate people for having sort of, um, you know, regular expectations. It's not condescending to an audience, but if for an audience who wants to, like, listen in for a little more creativity, that's also there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it, it's it's good like that in that um, you don't have, um, you know, because I think there's that fine line between um, sort of just, you know, fucking everyone off and, like, sort of creating subcultures that appreciate the music and um, sort of you know, identifying, like, the need for, um, you know, these tropes in a sort of, in the, in the mass culture, but sort of trying to, like, you know, because cause maybe the people composing the music like that sort of music to some extent too, but they also want, like, a little bit more out of it. They want to um, add a degree of um, uh, creativity that they find in maybe other, other sources of, of forms of music. Um, and so as a result, um, they want to bring those audiences in too, just to, you know, because... It's, it's it's why not because it's it's if you enjoy the um you know, part, of, part of the reason I try to uh, champion um all these you know more maybe more avant garde or alternative forms of, of wherever they be films wherever they be in music is because I want the enjoyment to be appreciated by as many people as possible I don't want this to be exclusive to be honest like I mean that's all well and good but like what a meme hanging out in this little boring little island here no I don't really it's not as interesting to me as if more people are in on the sort of dialogue and we can have the close conversations about is it too bandwagon is it too commodified but i also really think that again as i suggested the the net value is that you know if everyone's got a velvet underground nico t-shirt at least they're talking about the velvet underground and nico and then what andy warhol yeah. um there's just an um there's a balance to be had here um i, I think that's um not necess- it's it's not necessarily um yeah you know, it's not always there's not always that distinction of dumbing down or um sort of capitulating to masses I feel um but then you get to something like my next pick yeah Maruja the Vault uh, oh yeah okay so how how does the mainstream get to something like this and uh, should they feel bad for not appreciating something like this not necessarily well here's Maruja on the con this these guys are from Manchester. Uh, the post-punk tradition has of that region has now found itself distilled into more um, post-rock, sort of post-Godspeed You Black Emperor forms even, with, yeah. with some sort of uh, jazz influences in the percussion. Yeah, taking too. it back to like Canterbury as well. Yeah, good call. 
Yeah, like, um, you know, the, the group that, like, everyone was in, Soft Machine. Hell yeah. And stuff like that. Mm. And now, I think for those of us who are more, like, uh, hypercritical of, you know, is this truly original? Is that truly original? Uh, for instance, remember the album we talked about, Amandala, uh, Squid? Um, the yeah. Squid album from early 2021. Early this decade in 2021. Um, you will find, you know, a lot of people, a lot of reviews on Wikipedia saying this is original, this is brilliant, blah, blah, blah. Well, some people, you know, this is great, this is very listenable, good creative tropes, but also accessible pop music too. Sure. For, for everyone, you know, Life Magazine. But, um, <laughs> but there was also, I mean, you know, one review in there from like The Guardian or one of these papers being like, oh, this isn't actually that original. This is just like, you know, you, you can pick this band and that, 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 that. And it's actually not original. And it's like, it's true that to those people in the know, it's not the most original music in this world. You know, for if you have, to, you know, if you're in on math rock, yes, Squid's not the most original thing in the world. Sure. How many people in this world know what math rock is? How many people in this world would enjoy math rock? How many people in this world uh, would enjoy Squid? Seven. A lot more people would soon enjoy Squid than math rock. Oh yeah, seven people enjoyed math rock, and probably about. Six. 77,000 people. And who would have thought before Squid that you could have had a more, uh, a bridge between those two things, let's say, that, that if such a thing was possible or worthwhile, it would have sounded interesting. You might not have thought so. But then... Yeah, it's the, kind of like if Fugazi had pop along. sensibilities. There you go. <laughs> but, but the reason I'm interested in um, Maruja by the Vault is it's like the real... You know when post rock was invented by a British actor like Talk Talk was very optimistic, sunny, maybe a little bit new age even, but this is sort yeah. of like the grungier, like and a bit gothic. Is, this is bringing sort of the Godspeed you take on post rock back to England. That yeah, sort of grimy sort of um, you know, druid take on the genre. Yeah, that's what I really like. About Mixed with this. a bit of that sort of like Manchester, like grimy factory trope, you know, the, the factory records trope. Hmm. Like, um, I even heard recently they, they put out, like, a little single thing called The Invisible Man. Mm -hmm. And, like, th this album has touches of, like, you know, sort of singing and, and, and spoken word sort of moments. Whereas that one was just, like, full-on, like, just bombastic prog mixed with, like, Marky e. Smith-style chanting with a, with a bit of, like, a UK grime flow. Okay. And I'm just like... Like, this shouldn't work, but it does somehow. Wow. <laughs> Mixed in with, like, you know, that. <laughs> with Canterbury horns. It, it was a pretty cool little, like, five-minute song. Five minutes, okay. All in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, funnily enough. Yeah, no, what's, what's, what's interesting is that um, it's not that um, the what's happened in Maruja here is revolutionary. What, what's happened is they've distilled all these, this, these particular styles into a really sort of beautifully sort of um, English format. It's it's like um, you know, rather than a band from Manchester repeating the post punk cliches, they look at what the bands which are owe a debt to that particular region of the world have done since then, sort of bring it all back around. And it's like um, uh, yeah, it's almost like it's this cloud kind of coming back to to its home, yeah, and resting in this this one particular space, interesting um, vault. <laughs> And um, no, it's 80 minutes of very intensive, interesting. It's, yeah, it's um, a sort of album that's worth the 80 minutes too. Yeah, we, we were championing things like, um, this is almost like the UK's answer to those more contemporary sort of um, post, post, post rock, what the hell do we do now spaces as espoused by acts like from North America, like Audrey on um, Undisclosed Advertising and End Credits, previously yeah. been on Mandala. Um, and this is almost like... Um, uh, I don't necessarily want to call it the UK equivalent because I think Maruja has been around for a little while now. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. To be fair, I think Audrey may have been too. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not They've sorry. probably both been around for about 10 years or so. Mm. But um, to my memory, I think Audrey may have been only like active circa like 2022 20, onward. It's one of those band camp. I'm not even sure if it's a band, to be honest, so much as a yeah, solo. Yeah, like, like a project. Or yeah, you know, yeah. they're one of those things, exactly. Um, yeah, as far as the, like... Um, this album goes yeah like I said it's definitely worth the, the 80 minutes and like what I think is most interesting about it outside of the music itself because I was initially captivated with the first like 10 minutes and then I start reading the like the description of the video they uploaded and it was sort of the story of the album how it's the vault or whatever you know 
collected recordings of them jamming and stuff with a sort of phone um, around their, you know, like, uh, rehearsal room or whatever, I mm-hmm. assume. And I'm just like, man, I, I love how e- even something like a mobile phone can have the the sort of clarity or, or like, comparable c- clarity of, like, a sort of cheaper, like, Canterbury, like, prog production or something. Like, yeah, that's fascinating. You, you can mix in, like, like punk has gone full Ouroboros. <laughs> like, it, it, you can now have a DIY home job that can sound comparable to a studio production from its day, you know? And you can actually DIY a prog record. <laughs> like, it, it's similar to even when I was listening to New Martin Newell, and I'm like, man, he can, like, the clarity that he can get now from just home production compared to when he was at his peak. Like, he made the lo-fi stuff sound great, but it's just amazing how you can do that by yourself now, you know? Yeah, it's marvelous. It, it's fairly encouraging, you know? Similar to one of your later picks, I suppose, as well. Mm. But yeah, no, this album um, is definitely worth the journey it's like a almost like as well like a contemporaneous like dope smoker type thing the sort of like post rock sub genre type thing that you know takes you on some sort of trip through like a a sonic landscape I guess in the case of dope smoker it's uh the, the novel Dune yeah in the case of this like it's it's not even like necessarily the aesthetics of like say the album cover to me when I was listening to it, it felt more like the sort of like like you the the phone being the recorder is almost like you you know in their rehearsal room so you want to you're like you're hanging out with them you know similar to when you see like very old footage of like say Nirvana playing in people's garages at practice and there's like three other people there just like listening and drinking beers or something <laughs> It's like you're that for this band, you know what I mean? Mm. You sort of, um, it's like a sort of positive parasocial experience, I would su- suppose, you know, done through an album. Yeah, yeah. Which is neat, I think. Mm. Oh, you know, if, just for a moment, if I was to try and articulate the appeal of this sort of music to a wider audience, it, it's um, because um, a lot of our appreciation of music is so attuned to, you know, uh, more pop sort of uplifting characteristics um think about the different categories we approach when we're thinking about what what, what film you might want to pop on, on from your streaming service or program in the evening you know these you have your drama your remember romance. kids always pirate yeah well <laughs> comedy your, um you know sci-fi your, your horror horror is one of the things which a lot of people are like oh i don't like horror but a lot of people you lose oh yeah i want to kind of want to be freaked out I want of these bizarre yeah. sensations I want to watch a people will even watch some of the biggest things on Netflix documentaries about butcherous oh, true crime players. horror is the biggest genre ever people yeah. love horror yeah. and so I, I would suggest that like as someone who really likes horror movies I've always like found like some of these more strange and bizarre styles of um, abrasive music interesting in a similar vein similar head spaces mm. so uh, if, if so if that's what it takes to um, sort of uh, get you get the ball rolling on your interest in this sort of music uh, there you go I suppose but then again not everyone who um, enjoys the likes of Lucia Fulci's The Beyond would enjoy say uh, Giorgino from 94 or some of the particularly out there Japanese stuff perhaps mm. but maybe you would um, oh speaking of Japanese stuff uh, that wasn't deliberate um, Satellite Lovers oh. Sons of 1973 yeah Sons of 73 man this is a strange album I guess the story behind this album is that like it parasited its way onto everybody's YouTube channel within the last few months. Okay. And um, like I don't know, I just came across it and I was like, this just has like I swear somebody even like in my work mentioned that there was something that went super viral, and I'm just like, <laughs> is this it? Like a city pop album? And then I, I don't know, I found it sort of strange that it just like there was no public reviews of it that I can find prior to like a few months ago just as it like went viral on the internet like I'm sure it's a legitimate piece from its day but I wonder if it's some weird like culture jam thing someone's just like faked a Shibuya K era like well there's a record of this CD being released in the 96 okay and so it's possible that it's been like reissued as a streaming digital file it it has recently like I guess and then that's why somebody maybe the, the video was by whoever published it but it just seems like a user upload very rarely do user uploads would just go like super viral but anyway um 
as far as the like yeah weird story behind this album I, I guess it's one where like even if you you click on the hyper viral video as far as music goes of it like the all the top comments are just people praising the divine presence of the algorithm you know what I mean yeah so it's a, it's a weird case where it's sort of one of those but you know I, the, the, the reissue cover was kind of interesting it's just like Japanese slacker aesthetic and then it immediately starts off with this just like you know jazz funky like um yeah like city pop sort of thing and I, I just I kind of am a fan of city pop but I yeah. always just wondered yeah. whether the massive sort of like giant like deep sentimental love that like internet the internet seems to have t towards city pop hence why this might have gone super viral recently and listening to like the second I was halfway through the opening track of this song I kind of understood it and it sort of permeates its way all throughout this album I feel that like like I was saying with the previous thing like as far as parasocial experiences go like city pop feels like you get like it was like almost like catered to the otaku culture like it was probably made for like you know younger like adolescent girls in Japan or something but like this male culture like grabs onto it and then a similar sort of thing happens on the internet where the album just like it, it makes you feel like you're living the girlfriend experience you know you pay for it and then you have this sort of like experience of like running through like the you know that Masayoshi Tanaka um, album, An mm. Irresistible High? Yeah, In, yeah, sure, Insatiable sure. High. Yeah, I know that one. The top comment on that album was always, I thought, the funniest thing. It was like, this opening track sounds like I'm shopping for a sports bra. Huh. And so, like, as I'm listening to this album, it really feels like you're running through, like, Shibuya Square or whatever in Japan. Well, like, with your girlfriend shopping for a sports bra at Sports Girl with her or something. Hmm. And then throughout the whole album, she's just saying, like, you know, the opening track, she's like, I'm your girlfriend. And then the whole album, she's like, baby, baby, baby. Well, mm. I love you, baby. And I'm just like, this is so, like, it's, like, genuinely, like, engrossing in an emotional way. But I think I finally understood the, like, uh, prevailing appeal of city pop on the internet. It was always sort of an, an uh, uh, like, a elusive thing in my mind, you know? Like, it's got a worldwide popularity now. Yeah. Like, I randomly saw a video of some, like, European guy, who I guess just covers city pop is about like Masayoshi Tanaka and like even yeah this like Slavic guy is going like I love city pop <laughs> like this is the greatest thing ever so it like transcends like uh, language and nations well I think to, I think partly what it was is it was a highly modernist utopian music for a materialist sort of shopping mall 1980s and fitting in with the vaporwave era like people really who weren't around for it or like very young for it wanted vied for sort of a pre-internet era whether that was for parasocial reasons you know kind of imagining they would have been more social than not that they're not they're not thinking they would have been the deep dungeons and dragons nerds then they're thinking they would have been more social then it's kind of kind of kind of ironic actually but no mm. um i'm just gonna as a joke but like um to me i always thought the appeal of city pop i mean i think some of it's very kind of silky well produced uh pop music but i think yeah. the existential component to me always like I did kind of like the idea of a sort of like um I could see these compilations and then have um they'd have this uh, on loop this this image of a this gif effect effectively of a this anime image of a woman on like a subway like a looking over this metropolis at night sure and you're like, sure the existentialism of that uh, pre internet I think people felt like that was lost whether that was true or not was who knows but that was how people felt and I think yeah. that was a lot of how that's just one distillation of where that one video, which might even still be out there, um, that I'm remembering, which which I remember drawing me in, into the genre. And then you get here these amazing songs, you know, uh, five, six, seven, oh nine, and even wash my car. These just like yeah, uh, beautifully addictive pop. Yeah, numbers. like Junko Hashi was that Junko or Hashi? Yeah. Hashi, yeah, she was like one of the big the, the famous popular. compilation album with the Twin Towers on it. Tragically. Yeah, magical. That's yeah, classic. that's the one. Yeah, that, that's a good album. Mm. And there's good stuff out there. Um, you know, Night Driver, Driving Through the Night. Like, this mm. beautiful, beautiful um, CD pop out there. Was um, she a member of YMO? No. Okay. What? There's only... Because uh, I think there was some... There was a member of YMO who did a few of those albums, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I forget her name, though. Wait, but, there's no female in YMO. There was for a bit. Okay, no, maybe toward the end, yeah. I, I think they got, like, a... For, for live, you know. Okay. Live performances. Okay, because the original three is just those guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Like, excuse me. They would do live shows with like seven people, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, this is very solid. Um, I I wasn't aware of it before. These guys like they Dead Light Lovers did they have an album out in nineteen ninety four as well called Discord Music. Yeah. Um. They, so I it seems like they were an established thing, but this EP didn't get a maybe a re release until recently. Yeah. It's gone off. And um, yeah, it's pretty solid. But what's interesting about it is it is it has those city pop stylings within more nineties sonic context. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, like a bit pop, trip slacker, yeah. shoegazy maybe. A bit of that. Um, yeah, I, I was this is this is very solid, um, engaging and um uh, freshly, nicely, I guess, modestly, you know, utopian in the way it's been picked up by um uh, some of the listeners now, I assume. Sure. But, you know, the, well, the city pop things, it's interesting because, like, yeah, like I said, there was that, um, that adoration, like, like, it, it was, to no one's surprise, it, it took off at the same time as, as Vaporwave, if you know what I mean? And that sort of yearning for the 80s and the 90s, mm. um, pre-internet, pre-9-11, metropolitan sort of shopping mall ideals. But, um, I, I think, like, um, when you broke it down, it was like a very sort of, um, that very silky polished take on, um, sort of disco and post disco sort of soft rock AOR funk sounds. Oh, um, definitely. And yeah. from, from people who really appreciated it from the outside, you know, and then sort of taught to craft very sort of slick and disciplined versions of that. Mm. And so, um, as a result, like, and to those of us in the West who were sick to death of, you know all of the songs that we'd hear over and over again on the radio and um the cliches and plus you know um there is something about hearing a uh, foreign language where like because after a while in the english even languages you understand you don't really care what you're listening to on the sometimes you know you're singing along to a pop song and you go wait a minute these lyrics are rubbish or wait a minute these lyrics are quite you know graphic or whatever mm. um or in the case of, you know the kings fooled a lot of people back in 1970 for instance, infamously <laughs> Um, but, you know, um, if, if, um... That so, song was censored because they said Coca-Cola. Funnily enough. How ironic. Yeah, that, yeah, it? yeah. It they said they had to recall it with Cherry Cola. Phenomenal. That was fine, yeah. Um, but the, I guess, um... So when you're hearing music in this foreign language, like, people don't care. I mean, like, songs in Spanish and French were hits back in the, the 60s and 50s, and people didn't think twice about Yeah, them. yeah, definitely. Especially in England. Plenty of French songs were hits. There was a lot of Spanish songs that were hits here. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, I remember that's what my dad said. Like, yeah, you know, I did They were in the house, apparently. Okay. Him. Just Spanish song records. I'm popular. sure La Bamba was big, yeah. Well, yeah, just like, you know, like Spanish covers of, like, popular songs or... Were people liked and people may not have understood every word but they just liked the, the tenor of the voice um sure maybe it was less hackneyed in a way yeah. you couldn't understand like the word you couldn't you know picture you know someone saying that word and maybe that person saying it like he's just a singer he's yeah a funny celebrity or whatever um you could abstract it more when it was a language you couldn't actually properly decipher the words of sure um, and so i think that's the part of the appeal of listening to you know the music in japanese to a western audience not not Mm. Can't, don't know that can't translate it in their heads and so yeah obviously they repeat the choruses in English you know because that's I think that's the perfect Ooh, thing isn't yeah. it yeah be, 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 like, be. it's like they, they, they've got the that that sort of it's like when do you remember when uh, the, the guy from China Christ said that all it took for it didn't matter what Black Man Ray was about all it took for that song to be a beloved hit oh, was the bit, yeah, is the refrain. Yeah, 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 I could be wrong. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's, the City Pop got that, all you need is one little hook like that in English to make people, and, or in any song. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. Especially the refrain right up to it, like a good end chorus. Like, that'll take it over, definitely, yeah. Because mm. I don't even know what that song It's about. a good way to, because you got to build up to something like that in pop music, and then you build up to a big punch, and then, draw back, you know, and then repeat, right? Yeah. Yeah, really really good release here. I was happy to have, have, have listened to Yeah, it. I was quite surprised how much I liked it too. And it, it made me realise that sort of weird, sort of, yeah, like almost like neurological phenomenon of what like City Pop does. Yeah, know? I guess ASMR for people. Yeah, it's a bit ASMR in a way, but like, like that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It's I don't like, think ASMR is a bad thing. I don't participate. But it's, it's very effective as being a sort of like uh, innocent sort of like, like, 
like even the album cover sort of depicts you feel like you're in a love triangle like with some you know girl that you and some other guy are like fighting over or something like it, it's very like evocative in that sense yeah a- ASMR seems like a far healthier alternative than some other things people could be engaging with sure and this is that stuff where people just watch like subway surfers while people read statistics about like construction buildings or something I've never heard of that but that sounds horrifying yeah or like there's videos it's infamous where people like cut goo and stuff oh I've heard about the goo cutting I I don't get that either yeah that's on TikTok right yeah all the stuff's like on TikTok yeah shit like that Uh, if something is in like a a mobile phone aspect ratio on the internet you know it's just trash (laughs) I think that's a good way to distinguish like if, if it's in a format that's made for like computers or television <laughs> you know in, in a more traditional f- format of landscape it's typically it's probably still trash but it's a little <laughs> better than you know anything on like the <laughs> the, the portrait show. landscape like it'll just be a video of some guy from a podcast or something talking and then text appears with everything he's saying but he's talking in podcast talk where he <laughs> has to emphasize every word and so the text pops up as it, and I'm like who watch it <laughs> Like, maybe it's for little kids or something, but even then, I think they like more interesting stuff. Like, maybe it's just, like, old people that watch this stuff. I don't know. Yeah, they need stuff to stimulate their brain. (laughs) And it's not like this stuff's not coming out, because in the 13th of June this year, from Germany, resort by Ski Mask. This is considered IDM, Intelligent Dance Music. Interesting, that's what it's listed as. I was, I I agree, because that's what the conclusion I came to pretty early on. It's just, um, like, Correct me if I'm wrong. The previous album C yeah. that we uh, did on the show, yeah. that's a bit more like just ambient droney, right? Yeah, that's close to the EMT stylings, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this, like, the first two tracks are that sort of ambient intro. Whereas, like, then the you know percussion starts kicking in by the third track or so, and it goes into full like contemporaneous like the first like Aphex Twin album. Yeah. I'm, I'm just like, man, this is like. A great take on that sound and the whole way through from there it just sort of kept going up like my, my favorite in, uh, track on the first listen it was called like day gaming session or something and I was like man this is hilarious it was a great like for, for something like this sort of like you know wonky IDM like sometimes they create really rich and like almost like psychedelic textures that are just so um, yeah, it, it feels like, um, sort of like, uh, hallucinatory experiences that you have, like, uh, like as a kid who stayed up too late or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, that's sort of the sound of this music to me, I feel. But yeah, what, what are you? Oh, well, you know, it's amazing. Like, I remember when I listened to, um, C and when I also listened to, also from Germany, listening to, um, Nug's Bong Boat from this year, mm. um, it's, it's, I'm thinking like, these are very, like, they sound very contemporary and hi-fi, but creatively they seem rooted in certain 90s styles. And mm. it has me thinking, but like, you know, had these come out of the ni- in the 90s, God, these would have been, you know, this the most extraordinary sort of revolutionary, still acclaimed things. That's why people still love that first Apex Twin album. Yeah. Exactly. And, and and makes you wonder like, well, well, these things are similarly creative, maybe even more creative in some respects within those paradigms. And it's like, well, what's what's the... What, what, what's what's this signaling? I think what it's signaling is we moved too quickly away from that era for commercial reasons and because of sure. the nature of those sort of subgenres and especially electronic music, um, you know, and club music. It's a new sort of a gimmick each, God, half year, which six months, which seems to yeah. take off. And so uh, a lot of these styles and radical breaks from the past weren't experimented with for a particularly long period of time before the composers were inside in, in you know sort of motivated to move on to other other forms for whether commercial reasons whether for you know social reasons whatever it might have been to um, be fair perhaps with the technology of its day they they might have taken that sound as far as it could have gone back then oh you know what you maybe have your point whereas yeah. now with the capabilities that you know music production has now you can really fully realize these things again you know I, I think that might be it. Yeah, and I think, like, compared to genres which are more sort of um, traditionally, I guess, I don't know, like, instrumentally or, like, um, inclined to a popular music, like, you, you could say, like, you know, 
genres which are um, drawn from people playing instruments. Like it may be fair to say that we've done all we can in blues rock or progressive rock or um, post bop or um, post punk. And so, you know, when we do those things again, it's like, all right, guys, like enough of it already. But genres like those from the 90s, which were more restrained, not by uh, certain chords or, um, uh, you know, sort of tropes being exhausted to death, but rather just the technology simply hitting a wall, Mm. um, you know... I don't think it's 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 sort of like a misnomer to call these things revival so much as um uh resurrections of like what could have been you know expansion I mean? packs yeah well yeah i mean even that's like sort of um i mean I guess that's meeting halfway i suppose <laughs> at least um i mean some so, so, some some dlc is very acclaimed some be dlc is better than the original game i guess sometimes. i mean you couldn't finish fallout 3 unless you got the dlc is that, oh yeah i guess well you couldn't keep playing yeah 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 which i don't know is sort of Similar to this situation. Mm. Finally, we've got I remember Mass Effect 2 had the super hype, like, Shadow Broker DLC, and it was just a bunch of shit. Mm. So sometimes DLC is like... Oh, most DLC. It's just like, oh, the hype. No, Dragon Age Origins had the great DLC where you get the Golem. That's peak DLC. Cool. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something from 2009, so, like, that's just me, my age, you know. Um, anyway. But, like, um, yeah, but back to the current day, somewhat... Well, even though this sounds like it could have been from, like, you know, the top of the line sort of revolutionary 1990s, um, it still seems as though... Um, it's, nah, it's too complex in its, like, architecture. In, in the whole... Its production just couldn't have come out of the 90s. It wasn't technologically possible. So do you think to a casual listener, like, even they would... Maybe that wouldn't come up, but, like, that that like I'm a fairly casual listener, and I didn't quite... I wouldn't have necessarily picked up on that, but uh, I it's it seems that way. Or at least I was thinking that, and I sent it to my brother, and because it sort of reminded me of his work, like one of the tracks on it, which was like a very like breakbeaty sort of song, and uh, he was like, "Man, yeah, in, in a sort of the drum programming and stuff like that, definitely." But this thing has like a, a deep sort of like understanding of like hi-fi audio architecture okay and i'm like yeah i, I definitely i thought that there too like it's just it's very very sort of um expert you know mm-hmm. it, it, like this guy must have a rich understanding of sound technology you know yeah it, yeah i mean yeah germany has a very rich tradition <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure know. sure um it's it's very hi-fi like that that's probably it's most like sort of um, uh, like obvious or at least um, to me sort of was like the most sort of um, the first thing I noticed you know even beyond like necessarily the, the, like I said the construction and all the drum programming and all that stuff is very very advanced as well but mostly the the production design and, and the other thing I'm, I'm here's a thought experiment I want to play with right now um, the music that was said to have like you know moved these sort of styles existed in the 90s and maybe they kind of went out of style because just technology could only do so much at the time with with those styles but um say the genres that became more mainstream in the subsequent 2000s sort of like you know pushed this stuff to you know gave it the category of 90s music let's say rather than you know revolutionary music um the stuff that sort of um replaced it what, what what are we talking about in the 2000s sort of like you know like sort of milk toast R and B sort of like, you know, indie rock revival, sort of just like, you know, uh more uh respectable sort of like corporate versions of hip hop. What sort of replaced that sort of like edgy um EDM world of the nineties was effectively like disguised retro styles anyway. Yeah. So like nothing really did come along to like <laughs> make a lot of those 90s styles out of date. They were sort of just, like, n- neutered by technology and by capitalism. Yeah, um, yeah, Kind of just insidiously in the industry. Just, just wanting Like the Mamba these, revival of the late it's like 90s. The industry, like, saying, like, looking at all these DIY jungle ecosystem and thinking, no, we can't have that. We do not want that. Let's, let's, let's just enforce these, like, sort of, like, diet, like, bullshit, like, 
uh, most milquetoast sort of Muzak retro styles down people's throats for the 2000s. And uh, for what it's worth, they did a pretty good job of uh, subduing the population. So uh, I guess you did what you, you set out to do. Good work, guys. Yeah, terrorist attacks. But now Bandcamp, YouTube, wars. Spotify, Ski Masks is here. The 90s are back and the future is back. Thanks. Thank, thank you. I wish Mark Fisher could live to see it. Yeah. Someone in one of those videos I was watching was like, he would have hated generative AI. And I'm like, yeah, probably. But he was paranoid. That's about such it. a reductionist take on yeah, it. That's yeah, such yeah. A, well, like Mark Fisher wouldn't have seen the potential in that. Like Mark Fisher wouldn't have had a nuanced view on something. You know yeah, I mean? like, yeah. That's a, good, that's a good point. Get yeah, real, yeah. guys. Fucking idiots. Um, All them idiots. Oh, um... Speaking of idiots... <laughs> um, well, I see. Lovable. A genius name. I was listening to this album recently, and um, as, as I'm at work, and I'm just walking around on the streets of uh, affluent suburbs, and some lady pushing a pram, as one of the more pastoral songs from this album are playing, says, Whoa, what is this beautiful music? Wow. And then I smiled and I said, it's called bong water. No. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. And she laughed. Like, I was okay, like, yeah. yeah it's no, called... the, the Australians have a sense of humor to those of you Because she, she was like, yeah. It was, and I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. It's called bong water. <laughs> and yeah, bong water, too much sleep. I, I, I guess I already did. I've had one repeat so far in Mandela, which was Dog Bowl, repeating from Dog Bowl and Kramer. So I was just like, having heard this album fairly recently... Why not uh, do another repeat? But this time I'll do Kramer with his group, Bongwater. And yeah, man, what, what would you call this album? Like, I, I guess in the sort of similar sense to what I was describing. Mother's fans. Like, 60s oh, Mother's fans. Oh, they love the Mother... Like, even the opening track is, like, something like what Jimi Hendrix would have done if he was kept going, you know? <laughs> They just, they mix in so many different stylings of that. Like, as well, when I first heard this album recently, the second Splash 1 came on, I was like, oh man, I love how this is like a, a landfill indie cover of a fucking um, 13th Floor Elevator song from like 1989 or whatever. <laughs> it's genius. <laughs> and then just, yeah, all, all the like weird sort of outsider tendencies, similar to Zappa, like you mentioned, like these sort of sampling styles or, or like having a song like, Rolling Stone review or whatever it's just like it's yeah it's very zappa but very it's so haphazard some of it's so high school oh well. it's great that, but that's the whole it's called bong water yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that's sort of the point of the band like yeah, it, it's yeah. just it's like like foregoing all good taste yeah exactly yeah they're yeah. not in a really obnoxious but, but like but it's, they're very particular <laughs> they're trying to have taste but they're foregoing good they're like high. That's the thing. The high school is trying to have good taste, but not. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very particular it, parody. And, and I guess the pretty obvious comparison is, is it's very like Kim Gordon, you know, mm -hmm. in that sense. Which I, I guess the other main member of Bong Water is Kramer's wife from the time, um, who's the m mostly lead singer, or like yeah, does the <laughs> like you mentioned. It's so high school, but just so like I guess that's also the appeal of like the sort of. Um, Oh, you know, what's he called? The the Steve Albini thing. Big black sort of thing as well. To draw it again to Gen X and Kim Gordon. Because they mm. infamously had a song about Kim Gordon. <laughs> yeah, there's just something about this album. It's just such a... Similar, I guess, to like what I was saying with like Toy Love. It's an amalgamation sound. But of like all sort of like disparate psychedelic pop and like avant-garde stylings of the previous 20 years from its release, you know? And sort of each song will do a different take on each thing you know and in a way like it'll bridge the gap between retro and contemporary by like those sort of like high school elements like you mentioned like it's very like radiohead okay computer or even like this sort of contemporaneous thing of like a you know internet McLuhanist like overlord culture thing that sort of stalks all creativity yeah sort of I feel is almost like the MO of this band you know <laughs> Almost like they're at odds with the whole music industry. Like that that was sort of their their aesthetic was just to be Yeah, like like deliberately high school. <laughs> like crude. But weirdly like artfully crude. And like I don't know, within that you just get so much like sort of strange ideas that most other bands wouldn't bother to do. 
I think what you had in this era was we know the eighties is the era of like the uppies, right? But sure. We also like acknowledge it as the era of the people who are trying as hard as possible not to be like the uppies. And this brings us to Bongwater and acts like for Tilk. More sort of refined acts like Husker Du or the Minute Man or Sonic Youth. But also um, some of the more like sort of slapdash experiments of Bongwater, um, sort of, you know, sketches and um, sort of um, attempts at like little comedy routines, which um, feel like they're both from like, it's, it's slightly contemporary to sort of uh, hip hop genres, but also to like, but also a retro thing to a lot of sort of like those oddball like 70s, like humor LPs. Like, sure, sure. It's, it's just, I guess the, the mothers is the slash the fugs maybe is sort of a um, point of reference here. Mm. Um, I don't think this is like, it's not like a, I wouldn't call it like a, like a, I don't know this is sort of a superficial um, classification, but like I'm not sure mm. if we call it like a stellar album that I'm going to keep coming back to, but like it makes me appreciate the, um, earnesty of that Gen X sort of slacker world and I guess yeah. like I inferred mm. earlier just trying so hard to not be uppies once know? again that's the sort of MO of this world like they um like I, I was reading it as well because initially I came across this band I didn't even realise it was that Kramer guy because like one of the EPs wasn't on YouTube and like I was just reading recently like one of the people who played on that album was like Fred Fritt whoa yeah so it's from like that world if you know what I mean like Don Cherry's on one of their albums. Like, all these, like, random musicians. I know they're based in New York, but, like, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I th- Excuse me. I just think it's a case where that's sort of, like, it's anti. Like, it's very American in that sense. Like, almost like American primitivism. Like, a very underappreciated American cultural movement, I, I feel. Because, like, you don't hear much about it. Like, I never heard about it until I just came across it randomly. It's sort of, like weird permutation on like Appalachian folk and like New York avant-garde music and shit like that you know and it's this idea of like ugly music you know it, it's almost opposite in its idea of like you said like you, you don't necessarily want to come back to it as a stellar album like it's almost like the anti Sergeant Peppers or something <laughs> yeah 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 it, it's almost like that's the <laughs> so I do agree with you and that's sort of the idea of it in a way and um, maybe similar to like you're on your run with the 2024 sort of stuff, it was meant to be very contemporaneous to that moment, you know, to 1989. Hence why it probably doesn't have that timeless stellar album moment or whatever, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's sort of fascinating, I feel, in, in that sense. Yeah. It's, a, it's sort of a cultural icon. Like, it's called Bong Water. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and it's a kind of... And a group that didn't put out... that. Uh, anything their last release is 1992 I was going to ask um, do, you, so what, do you have opinions on like the other free releases of theirs no I actually haven't heard them but I want to hear The Power of Pussy that seems to be their most well known uh, yeah there you go because it's got a funny name and then just like Farrah Fawcett on the cover or whatever yeah <laughs> anyway speaking of, of foxes uh, foxing I suppose is yeah. the one we talk about next well actually just one thing about that Farrah Fawcett thing Remember that movie, The Short Skank Redemption? The only good thing about that movie must come from, like, you know, the Stephen King part of it, where you know how the poster keeps changing? Mm-hmm. And it's like a like a sexual icon and of each... Rita Hayworth. Then, yeah, so. and then Marilyn Monroe, and then Farrah Fawcett. Right. Uh, like, that's similar to also... Maybe that is what, like, Bong Water were trying to get at, you know, by putting even Farrah Fawcett there. <laughs> Pride of not Farrah Fawcett, Raquel Welch. Sorry, Raquel Welch is what I mean, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, got I, confused too, I got confused too, to be fair. Yeah, no, it's Raquel Welch. Yeah. I knew you, yeah. In that movie, yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking of Charlie's Angels, I guess. <laughs> well, yes. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. difference, maybe. <laughs> it's a sort of like contemporaneous like sem- sex symbol icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, which is the one genius thing about that movie, but I guess it borrows it from the short story or whatever. Mm. That character is constantly building a tunnel and covering it up with like the contemporaneous icon. That was a very nineties Hollywood trend. Like, um, I think, uh, I think maybe mimicking something like Goodfellas, like just to go through the decades like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. That yeah. was a huge thing in the always all through those nineties films, even to things that when you get down to like Dead Presidents, they're doing it. Well, that's too. true because in the short story, it's probably only Rita Hayworth, eh? Um, the I've read the short story, but like I don't remember. Okay. I remember in high school, you know what I mean? Like it's quite a while ago. Sure, but anyway, that's a tangent. Let's get on to the next one. Oh yeah, um, into 
this particularly interesting thing here. Um, I, I wasn't familiar with this group, uh, just at an FYI, prior to, you know, I saw this, this is a case where um, I'm judging it effectively based upon how it looks in the album art. Um, I once saw a video where um, an individual claimed that they chose to buy records based upon how they looked. And <laughs> the person said this was because they bought the first Boys to Cold album based on oh, this wow. and that was a great experience. Was the person saying this Roger Dean prog naysayers? No, it was Jello B. Arthur who said this. Yeah. So if Mr. Good Punk Rock Jell-O. says this, then I'm going to go buy it too. Well, you know what kind of pissed me off about this album cover? Mm. Was I wanted to start a band recently called Carl Benjamin. And they oh just, my God. they stole my album cover. Because it looks a little bit like the Sargon of... This a, is... Like the historical, the bust of the historical figure. This is like Sargon of a Cad's, like, scream. Mesopotamian, um, um, Conqueror. Mixed with, like, um... It's that visage mixed with, um... You know, technique by New Order. <laughs> uh... No, we, uh... But onto the music itself, because the music itself lived up to, I think, what, um was inferred by the image here because what we had here was sort of styles which are somewhat familiar to those of us who, who heard um, some more I guess old or emo styles like more like genuinely alternative not like corporate necessarily um, styles yeah not 2000s. like Panic at the Disco yeah yeah but by the 2010s like you mentioned like La Dispute earlier um, yeah not, on, not while we were recording um and it's like they're in the by the twenty tens and the like indie labels and things like that sort of um sort of to procure a bit of um um hype around um more like groups that were more like what we call emo in the nineties you know what I mean screamo yeah not not us we weren't we were barely alive then but um and so the sound Captain now Jones. is um but the thing is like when they were sort of I always felt like when they were pushing that sound in the two thousands and even in the twenty tens it always seems like sort of hollow and like sort of like I don't know like you have to be in sort of a place of like a pretty um, decent wear off to be sort of moaning about some of this stuff sometimes in the first place but like given the circumstances that I can't help but feel that when this music is being sort of quote revived unquote now it's not out of you know um, yearning for an era it's out of like actual desperation and sort of like psychological um need for release i feel like this sort of these sort of styles of music are more relevant to people under the age of like 40 than ever um it's it's astonishing to me that um like you know whether it's squid whether it's his collective whether it's um um omni and souvenir like this sort of like that um that sort of that ideal espoused by all the gen x like you know anti-yuppie groups who were um mentioning earlier um it's really still um, presenting itself as sort of this relevant bulwark and one that sort of like, um, I think, dodged effective commodification over the decades because there is still this, um, um, while the, the sort of gig environment is sort of dry, uh, dried up, um, you know, commercially, there is still that sort of like, you can almost see like, dare I say, YouTube channel slash band camp slash record label pages on um, social media is sort of um, the satellites of like what those things used to be mm. if you know what I mean and you can have um, um, efficient venues for um, alternative ways of, of thinking um, expressed via popular music forms I think that um, it's not that it's not that um you know, like, say, the post-rock revive, you know, reviving post-rock or slowcore styles, acts like Audrey, or even, like, like, we find, like, bands from Brazil and Spain are employing these sort of styles now, and it's not because they're yearning after, um, some sort of Red House Painters era, because that's, like, barely, like, an aestheticized, um, era in time. It's more like they're, that is, like, sort of the, that's the id being, um, sort of distilled onto the through the microphone I think it's it's not that we're um looking for um yearning for the 80s and 90s it's that um it's like nothing it's like the corporate world and sort of the establishment has like brought nothing along since then um for for people of that age bracket to really um sort of 
feel like releasing escape with. And so, um, yeah, that, that's essentially where I'm going to start with foxing. You, you continue, please. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I suppose that's true. Though, like, this just seems in continuity with the thing that started around that time. Like, this band's first album was from 2013. So I assume they, like, formed a few years before that. Where are they from? They're from St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. So, yeah, they're like a Midwest band as well. The, one, the thing I was most surprised about this album, because it starts off pretty, like, emo violency and, like, screamo, but then by, like, the third or fourth song, it, it, like, turns into, like, almost similar to, like, the Vampire Weekend thing, like an indie, like, chamber poppy sort of indie rock thing. Like, very soft and sometimes, like, falsetto vocals and stuff like that. And so I, I thought it was pretty interesting how it <laughs> mixed in, like, much softer stylings that are, I don't know, probably more sort of, like, indicative for uh, general, like, indie music, you know, listening, rather than, like, uh, the more screamo songs. Well, yeah, like, very violent and, like, borderline, like, emo violence. It's, like, very cool stuff. Um, but yeah, the... Um, Yeah, I don't know. Maybe... Because the album kind of opens up that way and then becomes like a sprawling, like, indie rock thing and then leans back into the emo violence then before ending, like, a, a bit softer again. Uh, that seems, like, hyper-conscious. This sort of seems like a... Which which I, I guess is a, sort of a case of, like, a, a band from... Whose first album was from 2013 and, and didn't break up like most of the bands from that era. Mm. Um, so, sort of, like... Um, maturing in the sense of like having a more sort of like con conceptual structure to an album you know because that, that seemed like a very hyper conscious thing I, I found that probably the most interesting thing uh, sort of about the album is it just seemed like it, it wanted it to be a sort of like a listening experience piece kind of consciously which is maybe why it's sort of like um, uh seems to have like a, a, a cult sort of following that typically like contemporary screamo bands don't really have anymore you know mm -hmm. it's sort of gone beyond that in a way which is interesting yeah. um though I did, I did kind of prefer it when it was more like punk like like hardcore you know mm -hmm. uh to its uh like it, it's um sort of prog pop neanderings got a bit cold play sometimes yeah yeah but other than that like it, maybe if they just honed it in a bit more but th that's very superficial as an entire piece it, it is fairly concise that's probably the one thing I'd just be like I, I wish wasn't there but th that's my one minor criticism I suppose but to be honest I think that's actually a fair criticism because I think it's an inevitable pitfall um, mm. I think because because an album like this, I feel like, and I think I'm, this and other bands I was comparing it to, uh, similar sort of acts I've, I've brought up of this ilk on Mandela, it's like, it's less that I feel like they're, um, because it's all well and good, I guess, to sort of mimic what are now retro styles, but when you're, when they're just going full sort of, um, express, expression and just putting the, um, just sort of this guttural wail out there, like you do kind of, fall into that sort of over emotional you know trap sort of you know sort of it becoming a bit melodramatic let's say sure and, um, falling into the cliche oh the most imagine. melodramatic band in history has got to be Light of Speed yeah yeah there you go it's got to be um so, well, so, maybe Touche Amore mm. <laughs> but always with, 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 with Light of Speed I always felt as though it was so sort of corporate and sort of like trying to like sort of like no it's not corporate it's more like Tumblr well, I guess the scene is what I'm like, trying to say. Like, yeah, he's trying yeah. to aspire after a certain like look, where it's like this feels more like people in in, in pain, and <laughs> I feel like that's some of the, that's what's really tragically distinguished a lot of the the bands. And you know, I've been praising groups of certain styles, which you know, categories of which bands that were popular of, of such brands, I, I wouldn't have found compelling or interesting in their earlier twenty tens forms. Let's say. But now, I wherever it's the quality of the musicianship, the amassing of creative influences from the past, but, but something, or, or just the economic 
um, terrors of, of the worlds we live in today, um, I feel like it's just the fear for ferocity and um, um, emotion that I hear in, in these bands feels like the most, um, it just feels like a, a whole coalition of, of people under a certain age are sort of um, um, trying to, I don't know, like, um, appeal, appeal, appeal for some sort of alternative, which, um, uh, an establishment is trying to, like, still, um, I guess, uh, demonize, demonize the, um, sort of dream, you know, this, this sort of, um, demonization of all the alternative existences or, um, um, utopian, whatever they want to um, dismiss it as. Um, yeah, I find, um, it is it's it's just um I, I wish that the um I almost um part part of me wishes that this this whole um you know, a lot of these bands that um I'm talking about could be um referred to as sort of nostalgic dreamers, but um the fact of the matter is a lot of those um styles from the eighties and nineties, um, which were composed then out of um economic stresses and um particular zeitgeists, uh f- feel more relevant and pressing, vital uh, scary than ever before and I think that's um, that's ultimately um, where I find myself getting into these genres slash these bands is um, the, 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 the weight of um, yeah the, the seriousness of the world and the shared psychology rather than appealing to uh, you know as you said sort of um, Tumblr aspirations sure yeah that makes sense yeah well now the Tumblr's gone Screamo finally got good again Mm. <laughs> anyway I'm actually endorsing Foxing I know it sounds um no but there is something empowering about um no it was a pretty that. solid album like uh like I said my, my one criticism is only a very sort of particular minor one I think the music achieves something beyond that you know itself which I can always get behind like I I, I, I like all foods you know I'm not too fussy mm. you <laughs> Sure, sure. In its own modest way. But anyway, on to more utopian pop stylings with Fraser Chorus, I suppose. Yeah, this off. probably the most utopian album ever produced. Um, <laughs> we've got Fraser Chorus, Wide Awake, um, from what, like 95 or something? Mm-hmm. Mid-90s, straight out of the trip-hop era. We have Britpop, but some people were like, fuck that shit. <laughs> And I guess in the case of uh, Fraser Chorus, they were like a Sophisti synth pop band prior. Whereas I, I guess this was probably like conceptualized as a solo project as well, but just got like labeled as Fraser Chorus. But man, this album, Wide Awake, is like a, a weird case of like, I don't know, just very, feeling like a very particular thing. Like uh, a mate of mine recommended their earlier albums, and I just noticed that this one wasn't even on the internet anywhere and I was like man just by the album cover this looks fascinating and I happened to just like listen to the album after uploading it like at three in the morning and I was just like the the opening track was so good I'm like damn I gotta play this again like it just felt like it was about what I was like where I was temper like you know so some people call it John Peel playing twice yeah the, it was sort of times. a John Peel moment and like I felt like temporarily I was in the place that this song existed you know <laughs> it was such a particular thing and um yeah it might be one of the best tracks of the 90s the uh the title track but then even beyond that like I, I just kept listening to the album and I'm like man this whole thing's kind of genius because it was just like once again in the vein of this like verbose like pop songwriting of like English you know the, the sort of David Bowie Sid Barrett tradition or, or like various people you know just laying Morrissey for example laying all these like you know poetic prose out into pop songs somehow and was doing it over just like steady like 90s down tempo like productions and um and then like the occasional like little sort of like jangle song like the, the third track Bye Bye Little Bird that's a sort of like uh it probably reminds me most of of all things, like the Icicle Works or something. Wow. Yeah, so like an 80s new AV jangle band, like on this like down-tempo 90s album. So this album has a lot of flavor to it. It's not just like the one sound all the way throughout. It's got like this very concise production 
And like, yeah, it's, it's in a way, like, I think I, I read somewhere, someone had like a, a review of this album or something, and they, they, they said that, like, the, the which is very true, we even covered it when we talked about Ray, you know, the, the sound of their first two albums is very particular to the era, whereas like this one just has a sort of, you, you know how in some ways like that trip-hop sound hasn't really gone out of fashion, so it sort of, it doesn't sound dated even now, like people still love Portishead and shit like that, you know? Yeah, with Champagne, the versions of 90s EDM. Yeah, earlier, sort of yeah, yeah, it's sort of still, like you were saying earlier there, like it's still very sort of um, neurologically cutting edge in a way, like um, our brains are still yet to wrap our heads around it. And so like, this album's also, it's like probably one of the most underrated cases of one of those I've, I've ever just happened to come across through like recommendation, like, um, and I was just going through maybe like a chart of, or like the older release of like, you know, down tempo albums or something like that. And I was like, Fraser Chorus, oh, I heard some of their songs before because of a recommendation. And then I was like, wow, this album is just like completely unknown. And it's so unknown that since then, I've changed the Wikipedia page like a month ago to say the opening sentence is that Wide Awake is the greatest album ever made and the third and final Fraser Chorus album. And no moderator on Wikipedia has changed it since. Oh. It's probably one of the, like, the, 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 <laughs> the longest streaks I've ever had on like a joke edit on wikipedia wow. and because no one else is paying attention to this album it's still on there like if you're listening to this go on the wikipedia page of this album it'll say it's the greatest album ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it is in a way the, the, the second last track might be the one weak point but even then it's sort of fun in a, like a prog kitsch sort of way but yeah what do you reckon? Oh, no, it's brilliant. Um, I, I would sooner um, say um, Ray is the highlight of the three. Mm. But this is extremely... Oh, this is as close to it, though. Like, the thing is, like, um, Wide Awake, the individual song Wide Awake is their finest composition. For oh, sure, sure. sure for yeah. sure. That's um, such a good song. And Driving. Man, I love that song. That's, that should be, like, a government PSA. Hey. <laughs> but, um... And I love all the, the trip hop stylings in general. It's amazing how um, he he adapted so fluidly to that world. Um, but yeah, I guess it's it's sort of telling that it's it's a mini album. I mean, I know there's a when there's a extended version of, of this which uh, I, I'm less familiar with. I don't yeah, I haven't heard, heard the yourself. I haven't heard the full album, the American release. Yeah, yeah, because like I mean, um, all the Sonics are great on here, but. Um, I feel like uh, on first listen, I feel like a couple of the tracks, like they, they mimic a couple. I feel like a couple of structures are mimicked mm. on some of these songs, and they're they're all very. It's it's a very pleasing and captivating experience, all the way through, and it's um you know so polished as to be um you know likable at every every space and everywhere you look is something to appreciate. Um, but um, as far as like um, but if I'm, if I'm looking at it like. Very uh, critically, um, I, I do wonder if, if a couple of the tracks um, mirror each other too closely. But in any respect, um, mm. I think the I think the slightly sad thing about uh, Fraser Chorus in terms of um, their commercial aspirations is, you know, they were a very sophisticated sort of um, classy breed of, of that sort of um, dreamy, slightly new age pop for the late 80s and I think by 91 I think the world was sort of moving on and even the UK was moving on from that sort of sound and so they were really never really were able to find a mass audience yeah and I guess just being which is strange because this album probably has their most contemporaneous sound to the time it was released yeah but sadly I guess Fraser Chorus not being sort of a, a name that had ever really caught on and if it and if it and if, if anyone yeah, was aware of Fraser yeah. Chorus, it might have been in a negative respect. And the Office wasn't a thing, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's worth mentioning that um, uh, Tim Freeman, uh, the is the older brother who's the songwriter of of and brainchild of Fraser Chorus, and technically this is more of a solo album for Tim Freeman than it is Fraser Chorus, right? Yeah, so yeah. so I've read. Um, Tim Freeman is the older brother of, of Martin Freeman, who we know first as Tim Canterbury from The Office. Bill Bobaggins. Bill Bobaggins a bit later, of course. Um, but yeah, no, so it's, it's one of these things where I, I think in the very, like, you know, pre-internet sort of, you know, um, word of mouth, you know, record 
CD shop culture. Like, I guess no one was going to buy Frasier Chorus wide awake. Yeah. Sadly. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I'm being hyperbolic when I say it's the greatest album ever. But but I'm being hyperbolic in almost a sarcastic sense. Because in a way, like, nothing's the best album ever. Yeah. And like you said, a mini album that's about 29 minutes isn't going to fit some sort of, like, uh, structure of what's the greatest album ever. It's a very sort of just like, yeah, hyper. But I think well, it's important that you, but the reason you said it was the greatest album ever, I think it is poignant because it may as well be. You yeah, know that, I mean? that's sort of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah like it it, 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 for what it's doing, for how it's making one feel at that point, um, and you're thinking, isn't this what the greatest album of all time should be doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, isn't this the criteria that ought to be being matched, met? Um, and um, it's the kind of thing where Wide Awake, you know, when I, when I first heard that song, um, I, I thought this was some hit song that I hadn't heard in years, you know what I mean? Like, sure, it, sure. It, it's, it's one of the most immediate songs anyone will ever hear. Yeah, and like I said, I had to play it twice. <laughs> and I, I feel like you... I think that the... That quality is is generally reverberates throughout the rest of the sessions, effectively. Sure, sure. Um, on for then then distilled as this little mini album here, and so I think um, which is to say, I think the rest of the album will have a similar effect, um, to this to that opening song, on casual audiences. You know what I mean? And um, you know, especially in social like, context as well. That song driving. Like, is there not a better chorus in, like... Like, it's almost like what Bernard Sommer wished he could have written on, say, something like Republic, or something like that. A chorus where the, the lyric is, like, like, forget about arriving, just keep driving. Like, that's genius. I, I don't know. I, I'm a weird, like, sort of cock for Tim Freeman. Okay. He's, a, he's a genius, I think. He, yeah. Somehow, this was, like, sort of dorky John Lydon... <laughs> he's even better than Pill and I love Pill yeah well there's that great lyric in, um, on, on the second track of Ray what is it um, and it's what is that and it seems your eternal reward is to wind up in heaven eternally born. oh yeah yeah that's great yeah it's such it, a good it, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of thing oh, that you wonder song... where it was in Morrissey you know what I mean yeah no he's, he's even better than Morrissey I think and I'm a big Morrissey fan oh the last track on Ray realise that she'd prefer you dead <laughs> yeah no like it, it, all three albums have great little pop moments yeah he's a beautiful anti-Brian like, Wilson sometimes but embodying the pop call at the sensibilities of like, Brian Wilson as well think about the second album sorry the second track on um, Wide Awake I forget what it's called but like it, it starts off with this slow like very like you know these soft synths and then like the hyper compressed snares that are all throughout the album and then like it, it's got like lyrics about how like the weather's gonna change and like I said it's these verbose lyrics and then it kicks in with like a baggy guitar like a Happy Mondays like wah wah chorus and I'm just like man how do they f like the just all, all the lyrics throughout the, that song are like crazy it's, it's, and it's just about the weather I'm like how can you be so metaphysical and verbose about the weather it's kind of nuts actually no, they found a way. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the sort of thing that, yeah, like Morrissey would do, but not even to the same degree. Tim Freeman's like the underrated Morrissey. Yeah, I mean, uh, tragically underrated in their time, but I guess uh, very ripe for rediscovery in the now. Uh, if if the, the past, you know, if the 90s were, you know, sort of too ignorant and sort of in a different place to be enjoying... Frasier Chorus made maybe the, the place where they're, where they're meant to brighten up is the present. Yeah. Frasier Chorus is a gift for the 2020s. Yeah. Then their time. Like even I was listening to the opening track today while I was just like, uh, you know, in transit with my, my mate who was the Vampire Weekend fan. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, this album's so good. And he's just like, man, you and I might be the only... Fraser chorus fans in the world <laughs> and I was like nah it, it's growing I swear <laughs> it will grow yeah well at least uh, if, if we, we know about if, if worse comes to worse um, uh, Tim Freeman has a, has a younger brother of some um, P Peter Jackson uh, residuals <laughs> uh, but um you know, yeah man he should start a, a record label that like re-releases his stuff and just pushes it in England yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's, uh, Martin Freeman has the money between 
between office residuals, uh, Peter Jackson residuals, and Sherlock residuals, and sure he's yeah, Fargo sure. residuals. He's in a lot of stuff. He's in Fargo. Remember that first season of Fargo? Oh, I thought you meant the um. Yeah, yeah. He's like one of the him and Billy Bob Thornton are in that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I thought you meant the movie, the Coen Brothers. No, movie. no, that was way back when. Yeah, yeah. I was like that. That could, he couldn't have been in that. Nah. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's now, I remember the British guy who was in like the new Twin Peaks season. Um. Oh, sure, sure. He had like some weird glove that these like metaphysical creatures gave to him and yeah, said, "Yeah, to, to defeat Bob, you yeah. must move." Yeah, to defeat Bob. They're like, yeah. "You must move to my destiny." To yeah, your destiny is to move to Twin Peaks. I, I only bring that up because it reminds me of Martin Freeman a bit, but it's also sort of how I think about music is like that character in New Peaks it's like these sort of meta- metaphysical creatures just give you a glove and they're like you've got to go here and like find this thing or complete this objective you know it's sort of um yeah the, the best of music in like uh you know most of the picks of this show are sort of encapsulate that idea right yeah as um as, as they when they would ask um the great um um Scottish American um analytic philosopher Alasdair MacIntyre, when they would ask him what drew him to to Catholic Thomism and um, later mm. in his life, he would say it, it's it's he said, A philosophic tradition finds you. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting yeah, way to look at it. I can't agree more, yeah. Which is sort of the best of music like this. Like e- even like uh the retro stylings of the ones I chose or the contemporaneous releases of yours, you know. They all sort of fit that same paradigm. It's a sort of serendipity or something, you know? And while we're feeling good about the 2020s, because something has to make us feel good about the 2020s, I suppose we'll end it here on a good note. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.